Hello everyone and thank you for joining me. My name is John Urgen and today I'll be talking to you about a joint project with my esteemed colleague Lia Thierry titled Retrospective Search. The motivation for this paper is fairly simple. Uh, many economic decisions are preceded by a process of search, whether it be research and development, mineral exploration, policy experimentation, or something as mundane as online shopping. And Take, for example, mineral exploration. If I'm looking for gold right outside my home, I have the choice to decide how deep I'm going to dig as a well for gold. And this information tells me what's the likelihood that I will encounter gold if I were to actually dig 50 meters to the left of where I'm digging. In particular, there is some correlation between observations I might have today as well as what I might see tomorrow. And my search scope is going to be a choice that's under my control. Our main question in this paper is to answer how ambitious should the search be? What should be our search scopes? And when do we decide that we have found something good and go ahead and implement it or maybe develop our mind at that most promising land? The correlation in this model is going to be captured by a Brownian path, and the search scope is going to be captured by a choice of costly variants. So, and in addition, we are going to assume that there is going to be perfect recall in the sense that once I actually decide I concluded my search, I can go back and choose the best option that was available to me. The main insights that we deliver is that the optimal search policy turns out to be surprisingly simple. There is going to be a rather simple stopping boundary, and the search scope is going to be a U-shaped function based on the difference between the best observation we have seen as well as the current one that we have seen. And this U-shape flattens out if discounting is to vanish. Additionally, it turns out the model is very tractable so today we'll be talking about an application to do a retrospective search with contracting, how you would commission someone to do a ser search on your behalf. The outline for today is going to be first a little bit of the model, and then I'll be giving you the optimal policy. Then I'll talk about the contracting application. And finally, I'll conclude showing you at the end what the relation to the literature is. As I mentioned before, we are going to be capturing correlation through a Brownian path. But instead of having a standard Brownian path, we actually have control, sigma t that is chosen by the agent that captures the search scope or the ambition that the agent has. We are going to assume that at every point that the agent continues searching, they are going to choose something positive, so they are not idling. And second, higher search scopes are most, more costly. So if I'm digging a larger well, it's going to be more costly for me. And finally, the perfect recall is going to be captured by us keeping track of the maximum along with this controlled Brownian path that we see. With these ingredients at, at hand, we can write what the agent's objective is. The goal of our agent is to maximize the maximum that they will encounter during their search, which is the first term, net of the cost that they accrue during the search, which is the second term. And our agent has two types of decisions at every point in time. They're going to be choosing both the control, sigma, their scopes, and when to conclude the search, the tau. And it is easy to see that Marco policies are going to be optimal. But Marco uh, states are a tuple in here. Both the maximum and the current observation comes into play. Before I tell you about the uh, solution, let me give you a few quick remarks. If you were to drop, for example, correlation from our setting, it turns out recall is completely unimportant. And simple calculus is enough to determine the optimal search scope, which we explore in a separate paper with Leah. If there is no recall on the model, then there is no point in searching at all. You're searching across a driftless path. 
But you might say, well, if there is no drift, why are you even looking at this problem? There is actually drift on the payoff relevant part, the maximum. In fact, the maximum is linearly controlled by your uh, choice of scope. And searching with larger scopes means on expectation, you're going to see better and higher best outcomes. Whereas instead, if you were to put the drift on the uh, underlying process, it would mean that the mere passage of time improves all the outcomes, which doesn't seem very relevant for some of the applications we consider. And then finally, adding risk aversion is something you can do instead of receiving MT, which is something we actually do in the paper, but I won't have time for it today. Now, the first thing before we even go is to say, what would stopping decision look like? If it's optimal for me to stop at the current maximum M and the current observation X, it's plausible that I would actually like to stop if I see something worse than X. And this indeed turns out to be true. So we know that the optimal stopping decision is going to be governed by a stopping uh, rule, which tells me to stop when the current observation is some function of the current maximum. Now, what does this mean? On the left panel, we see some rather simple functions, linear ones. You see that on the left panel, we have the M versus GM axis. But when you actually put it on a Brownian path, you see they do not look fairly linear. The green line is going to trace out what the maximum is. And the red and the blue lines are going to be the respective stopping boundaries we have. And for example, at the end of the picture, we see that you would stop if you were to use the red stopping boundary. Now let me tell you what the optimal search scopes are. The optimal search scope, sigma mx, when interior, is going to satisfy the formula that you see here. Now let's look at the terms one by one. On the left-hand side, we see that the costs themselves show up as well as the marginal costs. And then they're multiplied by an escape probability of a standard Brownian motion, where our standard Brownian motion is trying to escape from an interval identified by the maximum and the boundary attached to that maximum. Now, if you were to actually have no discounting, you will immediately see that the middle term is going to vanish and it shows us something rather striking that the optimal search scope would have been constant if it was interior. And it turns out that constant thing is actually also what you would encounter if you're at either of the boundaries, whether it's GM or near M. Now, why is this true? Remember our optimal stopping rule was of the form that stop if your current observation is equal to some function of the maximum. Now let me add a little bit to that, where we're going to consider a stopping rule that I'm going to stop if I actually stop, or we're going to stop our problem if we hit our maximum again. Remember the green line was always above the black line on the picture I had shown. This kind of stopping rule allows me to write the value function in a recursive form. In particular, the value of search when I have a current maximum M and the current observation X means I either stop before hitting a new maximum, in which case I'm going to actually just get M, which is the first term in the formula, or I actually hit my maximum again. Then I'm going to just receive the value function now at MM as opposed to MX. And then in between these two events, all I'm doing is accruing costs, as you see here on the last term. Now, the last term, instead of integrating over time, we might as well actually just integrate over the states that lie between this M and GM. And then we need to take care of the discounted time in there, which we're going to just say, there is this L function that is going to capture the expected discounted time 
our control process spans at state y when starting from x. Now, this formula and this translation is going to be enough to actually proceed. But to see a little bit more, let's actually simplify this a little bit. Let's consider the case where there is no discounting. If there is no discounting in this problem, the first two terms are actually not going to matter that much in terms of the choice of scopes. So in fact, our agent is only going to try to minimize the expected costs that are uh, spent inside the interval g m and n. But there is something subtle going on. Increasing sigma is increasing costs per time, but it is also simultaneously decreasing the time spent because you're actually increasing the speed of your Brownian motion. And it turns out if there is no discount factor, that L term is no longer exponential. It's actually just telling me the time I'm spending at a given state. And a constant scope that, or a constant speed is optimal. And this kind of constantness is actually has some anecdotal evidence. We don't see firms changing their research and development uh, department sizes as uh, frequently based on what they see. And in, for example, the gold surge example, uh, standard practice is actually to dig wells of uh, fixed depth. Even if you had struck gold or if you had just sit, uh, hit a rock bed. When R is larger than zero, then it turns out actually our agent is still minimizing the expected discounted cost. The other two terms don't uh, turn out to matter. But now the exponential term starts to matter. Near the, near the boundaries, whether we are at near M or GM, it's almost time to escape. So our agent would like to speed up to save on discounted time spent, but at a cost of higher costs per second. Whereas near the middle point of that interval, our agent is saying, well, my discounted time to escape is too far away, so why don't I try to slow down and save on my immediate costs? Now, of course, that L function was in terms of our controlled uh, process, but it turns out using properties of Brownian uh, motion, we can actually separate those into the occupation and speed measures to actually end up with the formula that we have seen before. Now that we have the controls, let me talk about when we are going to stop. It turns out the stopping boundary that uh, we have seen before, the linear ones, are actually optimal. And those linear ones have a special name. They're called drawdown boundaries. And the gap between the 45 degree line and where the line lay is called a size of the drawdown, which means if you observe that gap, you are actually going to conclude your search. And we see that uh, the close form of the formula is fairly simple, but the hyperbolic terms are showing up just because they are capturing the escape probabilities of our Brownian motions. Again, if we were to actually take r equals to zero, then the formula simplifies even more. One thing we can see here is that simple calculus is enough to actually show that as R increases, our drawdown is going to decrease. So our agent is willing to stop a little earlier. Now, what's the intuition for this? It's actually fairly straightforward. Suppose instead of staying at M and X, we bump everything by A. Since our utility is linear, the solution should be the same, which in turn means the gap between the maximum and the boundary should remain the same, which means it's actually constant. So we are going to have a line. With risk aversion, this is no longer true, but that you can actually look for in the paper. Given the close form of the boundary and the scopes, we can also calculate the value of the search. And again, the simplicity of the value almost invites applications that you can look for. And indeed, we actually look for one, where you're looking for a commission contract. You hire, let's say, a drilling firm to actually search for minerals on your behalf, 
and you're going to be actually sharing some of the profits that they're going to find. Similar examples you can find in research institutions or art dealerships. So formally, we're going to have a principal contracting an agent where the agent is going to be doing the retrospective search. And for the search, our principal is going to offer a commission, a share of the final outcome, as well as a fixed fee or a fixed wage of W as long as the search goes on. Our principal is not going to observe what the agent is doing, but they're going to see whether the search has concluded, and if so, what the final outcome is, and our agent can quit at any time. This yields a fairly straightforward contracting problem. Let me start by the middle line. The middle line is our retrospective uh, search problem, where instead of getting uh, empty, our agent is getting an alpha share of it. And instead of paying the costs all together, the costs are offset by the wages that our agent is receiving. The last line is your standard participation constraint. And the principal object, principal's objective is that they're going to receive whatever is left net of the commission they pay, and they will be paying the agent as long as the search is ongoing. Now, the agent solution is fairly similar to what we have seen before. We see that the sigma is going to be constant since we have no discounting in here, but the wages are shifting the cost level, even though they have no impact on the margins that you see. And the agent's optimal stopping is going to be, again, a drawdown, where now the drawdown is scaled by the commission. One remarkable thing here is that the rate of your commission actually does not change your scope, but it does change both the outcome and the search duration. Because if I'm receiving very low commissions, I'm just stopping almost immediately. Now, given this form, we can actually solve the entire contracting problem as well, because that was the hardest part. And I don't expect you to digest what you see here. But one thing I want to highlight is that the C double prime now actually starts showing up, which is, again, as usual, capturing the uh, incentive rents uh, that our principal needs to pay to our agent. Now, hopefully, we have delivered a tractable model for a search with correlated observations that has a remarkably simple uh, policy, and that can be applied to various settings. And we indeed explore two of them in two different papers. And we also have uh, another version where we look at the joint search with another co-author. And with that, I would like to thank you for all your attention and show you a little bit of the related literature.